Well, hey, welcome everybody to Evergreen Church. So good to see you, your smiling faces, all of you lovely people here. Those of you joining us online, we're so glad that you're with us today as well. Would you stand to your feet with me across this place? Look, today, you didn't come to a concert. You came to join the choir. So we're going to sing. We're going to worship. Let's go. Here we go. Come on, you can put your hands together with us as we praise God. Like, 
This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. of all kings. God, we've come today not to seek our own good, but God, to bless you, to praise your name, Jesus. The king is in the room. Come see the scars of love upon his hands. The king is in the room. the darkness flee at his command. Who is this king? Who is this king? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Light of the world. There's freedom in his name. Awesome in power.
lift the name of Jesus in this place. His name is Jesus. open yourself to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. God's here. We're singing to him. He's speaking back to us. Just give him another couple moments of your attention. Lord, if you have anything to say, would you say it? Our hearts be open to receive it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.
would you replace our doubts with your truth, with your faith, Lord? Cause you can do it. God is more than able. 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 Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? worship you, Lord, and we proclaim that you are more than able. Oh, God, we just come before you. Many of us with burdens that we can't carry on our own. Things that are beyond us to solve. Things that are way too complicated. And yet, we know that we serve a God who is above it all. So we come in this moment in faith. We come in this moment in trust, not that you will just do whatever we ask, but that you see us, that you love us, and that you are more than able. You are stronger. You have more hope. You have more life. There's more grace in you than we could ever give or receive on our own. And so we worship you. We trust you. And we release it to you. We release it to you. Just take this moment and if you're holding on to something or something is weighing you down, it feels heavy, it feels undoable, unmanageable, un it's just not possible. Would you just take a posture of openness with your hands and release. Instead of holding on to it for yourself, release. Release it to God. And God, in this moment, we release control. We trust you. We put our faith in you. We know that, God, you are more than able. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you say amen with me? Amen. We're going to get to do a few child blessings. This is one of the great gifts of what we get to do as a church together is bless the little children. And so I'm going to invite up our families. We've got two families that are uh, have brought their children to be blessed. Come on up. Come on up. Yes, we can welcome these families. And Josh, could we get, get the house lights up just a little bit? Because I want, I want you to be seen by these parents. Because part of this is on us as a church to do. This isn't just a, a pastor saying nice words or blessing children. This is us as a church coming together around these two amazing families and committing to be faithful and a part of their lives. And I know you guys set a great example and sat down, but could you stand and be active with us in this moment and uh, participate in blessing these families and these children? Because again, I'm one person, but together as a church, we can make a difference in the lives of these parents, in the lives of these young children. And so would you commit 
with me as we do this together to be a part of these two families far into the future, to help these two beautiful children. Hi, Nora. Hi. Me and Nora are buddies. I just, I want you to, I want you to know. And He's got a sucker, which is awesome. Like that's that's smart parenting right there. Uh, that's smart parenting. Hi, buddy. I know he doesn't want to look at you. Ah, that's dad. Yeah, dad's safe. He's good. All right. I wanted to read a few verses over you as parents, and I'm gonna turn and just face you because they don't really matter right now. You guys are who matter. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna look at you. And sorry to all you online. You can read the back of my shirt. All right. There's. Uh, a, a great example of some amazing parents that I think we could follow, and that's Mary and Joseph. And so one of the things that Mary and Joseph did is when when the, Jesus was being raised, it says this, it says that Mary and Joseph had done everything required by law by the law of the Lord, and they returned to Galilee from Nazareth uh, with their own or to their own town of Nazareth. And the children grew, the child grew, I'm learning how to read still, the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. And I love that verse because number one, it shows that you as parents have a part to play in this child as well. We as a church have a role, you as parents have a role, but ultimately what we do as parents is we entrust our kids to Jesus. And I love what happens next is Jesus then, they go to Jerusalem and the parents forget the kid in Jerusalem. You know, they forget Jesus in Jerusalem. They go back trying to find him and they finally find him and they take him back home. But it says this, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with both God and man. And that's what we want as parents, right? That we want our kids to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with both God and man. And I believe that God wants to do that and bless your families today. So I'm going to hand this off. Could you hold on to that? Thank you so much. And we want to pray a blessing. Jeffrey, you can come and pray. Could you guys get closer too so Jeffrey can reach both of you? And we're just going to pray a blessing over each one of you guys. Hi, Nora. Hi. And would you join me, church, in praying these blessings? Jesus, I just thank you for Nora. Thank you for just the joy that's inside of her and the life and the passion that you've placed inside her. I pray that she would be a blessing far into the future, that she would know you from a young age, that she would grow in wisdom and in stature with both God and man. And I pray for Layla and Matt. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you give them wisdom as they raise little Nora. I pray that they would be uh, the perfect parents that perfectly imperfect, that raise her to follow you and love you and know you from an early age. And I pray for Asher, and I pray that you would bless Asher, and that he would enjoy suckers long into the future. And I pray that you would bless him, give him favor with both God and man, bless him with wisdom and stature, that he would know your Holy Spirit from a young age, he would know that you were with him and you would fill him from a young age. You would use him to lead in the next generation as someone passionate in faith for you. I pray for Bryce and Hannah. I pray that you would bless each of them with wisdom as they raise little Asher, as they ask so many questions of who he is, his character. I pray that you would bless them in knowing how to shepherd and grow and develop into who you've created him to be. And I pray that you would help us as a church to honor these two young lives far into the future, that we would be their present and active in their lives to do our part to bring them into who you've called and created them to be. So we thank you. We love you. And can we say it all together? Amen. 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 You guys can go ahead and have a seat. They received a Bible that they can read together as a family. And I had a a family of a a young child uh, ask me after first service. They said, you know, we're just wondering, are we doing enough? They've got a young child who's about three and one that is one. And they're they're just kind of asking, 
we just want we just want to make sure we're doing enough. And I just want to say that Bible is a great gift now, and begin the habit now of reading to your children, and that will become a habit far into their life where they can know the Word of God. I also love to see I see grandparents in the room. I want to acknowledge the grandparents. You guys also have a profound piece to play in the raising of these children. And God wants to use you and give you wisdom to encourage, come alongside your own children and your grandchildren and to bless them far into the future. You have a profound role in their life. And so thank you for being a part and making a difference. You're so important. And that there is part of our vision at Evergreen Church this year, families of wonder, that we would see from a very young age all the way through that we would see people of different generations pouring into our young kids, investing into the next generation, instilling faith and hope and life into the people that are growing up. These little people, they look like babies now, but they won't be for long. And God is building up the next generation through you. So thank you, Evergreen Church, for being a part of that. We're going to take a moment to welcome each other. And I know you just sat down because you're good church people, but I'm going to make you stand up again and welcome people because we are a welcoming church. We are a church that includes people and brings them into the family. And so would you stand with me, welcome somebody next to you, give them a handshake, a high five, a hug, whatever you're comfortable with, meet somebody you haven't met before. I also want to say welcome to everybody joining us online. We love you. Thank you for being a part of Evergreen Church. You are valued. And last week I met somebody who came for the first time after watching online, and they were able to become a part of the Evergreen Church family. And we want to include you too. So come and join us, hang out with us, and we can't wait to meet you. And in... And now, and now, and now, and now you can sit down. There you go. Thank you guys for being here at Evergreen Church. I want to invite you this Saturday to the Alpha Refresh. What is Alpha? Number one, Alpha is a great thing that you can do, but there's this great, significant moment where we get to spend a block of time together. It's from 9 a.m. to about 2 p.m. It's like five hours of your life that you could spend focused on God as a family. And so I want to invite you to be a part of that. In a moment, you're going to see a video on the screen. You're going to be able to sign up and register. But I I didn't want you just to like tune out and miss it into the video because this is so important. Because in our world, there's so much competing for our attention, right? Like even now, you could be distracted with so many different things going, a sports game or Uh, you know, your favorite show or a book you're reading, you're paying attention to that or you're checking your social media, whatever it is, we can be so easily distracted and yet God wants our attention. And so would you give him your undivided attention for five hours? That's coming up this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. There will be breakfast provided as well as lunch. And when you come, you're going to have fun together. You're also going to be able to meet people that you haven't met before but you're also going to meet the Holy Spirit. And it's a great way to be refreshed and renewed in your spirit. If you're feeling the the February blues, come on, Pacific Northwest people, you know what I'm talking about, the February blues. This is a way that you can get out of the February blues and into summer before it's summer yet, all right? So come this Saturday, 9 a.m. Again, please register. That just helps us to make sure we have enough food. So turn your eyes to the screen, enjoy this video, find out how you can get involved, and let's do this together as a church. Amen? Subscribe to the Evergreen Church YouTube channel and follow us on social... So- oh, that was close. Close. On social, 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 social media. <laughs>
We would love to hear from you and answer any questions we can about how to get more connected and to find out more about Evergreen. If you're online with us today, you can scan the QR code and get a digital version of our Connect card. We also have a free My Purpose magazine where you'll learn about the heart of Evergreen and more about our core values. Feel free to pick one up on your way out. Men of Evergreen, let's unite in prayer for Evergreen. Join us on the first Thursday of the month at 7 a.m. right here in the Foundry. Together, we can lift up our church and our community. After prayer, come and join us at Alexa Cafe for breakfast. Mark your calendar. It's going to be a great start to your day that you won't want to miss. Looking forward to seeing you all there. I got a couple of things here to refresh myself. A great chai latte from Culture's Coffee House. And scrolling through my phone. But you know, it's really not that refreshing. I have a better recommendation. This coming Saturday, you could give five hours of your undivided attention to God at Alpha Refresh. It's a time where we have fun, we have great food, we hear about who is the Holy Spirit, how do we experience Him, and then the whole worship team is there and we worship God together. Have you ever given five hours of your undivided attention to God? This Saturday you can do it, Alpha Refresh. Just go to the Evergreen Church app. That's where I am right now. You can sign up online. Plus, you get a free Cultures drink as part of the whole experience. Come and enjoy the experience. Even if you haven't been to Alpha, everybody is welcome to Alpha Refresh. And remember, Evergreen Church is Jesus changing lives through you. Now would you welcome with me Pastor Philip McCallum as he comes up to share the Word of God today. Good morning. Good to see you. Welcome everybody joining us online. And God brought you here today because he wants to make you more influential. All of us are here to enlarge our capacity. They say that the average human being knows about 10,000 people, probably even more in our digital age. That means that the impact of your life is far greater than you could possibly imagine. Don't underestimate what Jesus can do through you. The vision of Evergreen Church is Jesus changing lives through you. Not through Pastor Phil, Pastor Caleb, but Jesus changing lives through you. In a sense, anybody here can become the pastor of the people that you meet and you know. Whether it's in your neighborhood, in the workplace, where you work is incredibly significant in the kingdom. You are reaching people I could never meet. And they won't listen to me, but they're going to listen to you. You and I need to have an enlarged capacity and that's why this year, our word for the year, if you haven't seen yet or guessed yet, is wonder. Now, wonder is a powerful tool. It's a childlike expectation to be surprised. And you're not embarrassed to say, wow. Like so many of us in life have been trained to say, how? Instead, we should say, wow. That's really cool. Wonder is a spirit of faith in a supernatural God. And today, God wants to expand our capacity. I think every year since 2020, we get over a little more of COVID than we did the year before. Amen? And you and me are getting into a spirit of wonder, a spirit of expectation. Let this be the year we really shake it off. I mean, like totally shake it off and break out into what God has for us. This can be one of the greatest years that you have ever experienced. It's not simply because of you or me individually, but it's the church that you and I have been put into. There's something powerful about the simple decision to come in this room and be with these people because God does powerful things through the anointing of a congregation. I love Evergreen Church because it defines who I am. It defines who you are if you're part of this congregation. This vision for wonder, which Pastor Caleb is the one who's bringing this to us. I asked him last year, would you pray through this vision for the year? And God gave him that clarity about the word wonder. As soon as he spoke it, we as elders just felt like somebody had opened the windows and oxygen had flown, flowed into the room. It's a sense of wonder that's expressed first in prayer, wonder prayer meetings on March 27. Make sure that night you clear it so we have time to wait on God and receive from God. It's wonder families. We're paying particular attention to all the little gaps that happen in the development of our lives where, you know, we can just 
disconnect in our relationship, perhaps with others or even with God. Uh, it's also wonder it, that we, I've got to look at the vision myself to make sure I remember it, uh, wonder tables, tables of wonder. The, our small groups are more than just people sitting in a circle with Bibles on their lap, but we are seeing Jesus in one another. And this is where food is so powerful. What happened at Alpha can also happen in your home, wherever it is that you're going to meet and connect. And then today I'm going to talk about the Bridge of Wonder, how a church like ours, and we're hundreds of people, but we can affect thousands of lives, millions of lives, not only here, but around the world. You and I have no idea the impact that we will make in the future, not only in this world, but in the world to come because we've been here today. I'm praying that God gets you excited about the potential of your life. Yeah. Is anybody going to be as excited as she is? <laughs> so today I want to talk to you about enlarging your capacity through the bridge of wonder. Evergreen Church, God wants to do far more through us, ten times more through us than we've ever seen before. Um, if you and I will really get a vision of the Bridge of Wonder. This is not a bridge I've made up. This is clearly from the Bible. Today, we are camping in one book, the book of Romans, one of the most profound books in the New Testament. It's that one book through which we navigate so much in the New Testament. And the message of it, I think, is sometimes so big and so colossal, we miss it. We kind of read it looking for a verse here and a verse there, and we miss the main point of the whole book, the Bridge of Wonder. I'm first going to tell you what the Bridge of Wonder is, and then we're going to break it down piece by piece. Are you ready? Here's the Bridge of Wonder. The Bridge of Wonder is this, is that for 2,000 years, God has sent the Jews to bring the light to the world because the Jews are a light to the nations so that the Gentiles would believe. If you believe today in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you're praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you can thank a Jew because your entire Bible was written by Jews. Your entire faith was delivered to you through the Jewish people because that's the plan of God. Now, the second part of the bridge, because bridges work both ways, it's people who come to you, it's you who go to people. The second half of the bridge is that in these last days, God is going to send the Gentiles from the nations to be a light to the Jews. Because the book of Romans clearly tells us that there is coming a great awakening in the nations greater than the book of Acts. And if the book of Acts is astounding, just wait until you and I see what God is going to unfold. And you and I are going to be part of that. Because he says he's going to take people from the ends of the earth and the nations will stream to Jerusalem. And it's going to be Gentiles who bring hope to the Jews in the God of Israel and his great plan for the nations. The greatest harvest of souls, the greatest awakening the world has ever seen is going to be when the words of Zechariah are fulfilled, they will look on him whom they have pierced and all Israel will be saved. Now, in your Christian experience, you might have missed that. Uh, because often when we read the book of Romans, we read it personally, or maybe we read it just for the people we know. Because the book of Romans, probably clearer than any other Bible book, gives us the plan of salvation. It gives us the hope that Jesus came, he lived, he died, that we who are sinners can be forgiven through him and by faith, in him, like Abraham had faith, we can walk into newness of life, and through baptism, we leave death to life. We overcome the old man. We live in the newness of the Spirit, and we live in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the message of the book of Romans, and most people just take that part of the message, but there's so much more to the book of Romans. Romans 11:25. 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. The word mystery in the Bible is so intentionally chosen. It's very rarely used, and when it's used, 
It's about a secret that God has kept so private, so personal, that not even the angels know about it until the exact moment when God reveals the secret to be seen. One of the secrets is the resurrection of the dead. Another one of the secrets is that all Israel will be saved. There's many times I'll be sitting on an LL flight surrounded by lots of yarmulkes, or I'll be standing at the Western Wall with lots of people with the tallit and the teflon. And, and in that moment, I think these words are true. All Israel will be saved. This isn't a side message. This is actually the core message of the book of Romans, that God has a plan that the Jews will bring the light to the nations, and at the end of time, the Gentiles will bring hope back to the Jews. This is why it is so important for you and I as believers to think differently than the world that we live in. Today, anti-Semitism is on the rise. Since October the 7th, the number of incidents of anti-Semitism statistically are up by 362%. In Western Europe, most Jews are terrified and want to leave the nations where they live. Over half the Jews in Britain want to leave to immigrate to Israel because Jews feel safer there because that is the homeland that God gave to them. And you and I are living in historic times when Jews are open to the people of the nations who take time to help and to care and to listen. And I know it's true. I've spent two times, two trips that I've taken to Israel. I've spent a total of three weeks in Israel since the war began. And I've never seen people so open and so responsive to compassion, to love, and to understanding. You and I live in a momentous time. My wife had an uncomfortable conversation with me nine months ago. Have you ever had one of those? This is how it starts. I have something to tell you, and I don't want you to react. <laughs> you been there? We were driving on the freeway. We're on our way to Milan and Alona's wedding. I forgot all about your wedding, but boy, that conversation got my attention. When she finished talking, uh, we checked into the hotel, and I went for a walk for about two hours and prayed because she called out my potential. Now, she knows me better than anybody in this room. She's been with me for over 40 years, and she knows what's inside of me, and she knows what God is doing in me. And in that conversation, she reminded me that my timeline and God's timeline aren't always the same. Um, in 2018, I took a profound trip it was a sabbatical. We do this for our staff every certain number of years. We take time away to get restored spiritually. And I prayed. I said, Lord, where do you want me to go? And my name is Philip. I'm named after Philip in the Bible, who landed in the city called Azotus, which today is called Ashdod. And that day, I happened to be reading about Philip. And I happened to read about this city. And I felt like God said, go to that city. I look it up on a map. I said, what hotel do you want me to stay in? And he pointed out a nice hotel. I thought, oh, this is a great hotel near the beach. Checked into the hotel. Went for my morning run. I saw this beautiful sand dune, huge hill. And I felt the Holy Spirit said, climb that hill and pray there. I didn't know that that hill was the prayer hill where one of the leading spiritual leaders in the Messianic movement, these are Jews who follow Jesus as Messiah. It was three blocks from his house, and that was his prayer hill where every Friday he would pray over the city of Ashdod. Well, I was up there on the mountain praying, and he said, now look for this church in the city. And so I went back to my hotel, and I Googled. I found there was only one church, a church of 450 people who've now become as close to me as my own family. It's my other church home in addition to Evergreen Church called Bet Hallel, means house of praise. And that group of believers um, have been holding on a tenacious faith, a lot of persecution, a lot of opposition, but they have continued to prevail. And the first person who met me is a young man who you're going to meet in a few weeks. His name is Sasson Pakhtar and his wife, Sophie, and their two beautiful daughters. And one of the things I had prayed was, God, I want to be able to come to Israel, know a pastor who lives here, and always stay with these people in their home. And Steve and Margie, you were on the flight when I prayed that prayer, and God answered that prayer two, weeks, two years later because Sasson and Sophie always have me stay in their home. I'm always there with Israeli people whenever I'm in Israel. And on that mountain, God spoke to me. Uh, he said to me that, like Philip had a house in the Bible in a city called Caesarea, that there was to be a house in Israel where people from the nations, from all nations of the earth, 
would meet Jews who believe in Jesus in Israel. They would be blessed and receive prophecy, and they would go home to greater influence because they would be awakened to the Great Commission. And I've been praying about this since 2018. And in that uncomfortable conversation, my wife was calling out my potential because I had a timeline of how it all would work, and I had it all managed and all figured out, and it was somewhere in the future. And she said, no, I really feel like it's now. I began praying them into this. It really agitated me, to be honest. Uh, I was really upset because I, I love this church to the core of my being. Uh, but as I wrestled through this, um, I just felt like God said, I want you to go to Israel and spend a month to pray there. This was in June leading into July. And my wife, uh, one day we were praying, she said, uh, you know, I've been feeling like God wants you to go to Israel for a month. I didn't know that she wanted to get rid of me or whether she wanted me to pray and seek God. So uh, I said, that's exactly what I felt God said to me. So I got on a plane, went to Israel. And in that month, he told me some specific things. Number one, he said, I want you to pray through the Negev Desert. And little did I know, I was praying to the areas that were later so brutally uh, attacked by Hamas, where so much disturbance has happened. I've been all along the border of, ba border of Gaza. Uh, then uh, the next thing he told me to do was he would open up business contacts for me. And through incredible series of divine favor appointments, I got to meet the core team of the largest tour company in Israel. They bring 800,000 people to Israel a year, 800,000 people. But they're owned by a credible uh, believing family, the Smadja uh, family, and uh, they just kind of took me into their hearts. We went hiking together, spent time together, we had Shabbat meals together, and they just loved on me, and I've loved on them. It's been a beautiful um, relationship and opened up lots of doors that make so many things possible. And then the third thing he told me to do was to spend quality time praying in the Galilee. One day I was in there praying in my Airbnb, and I had this incredible visitation from God. I mean, it was so powerful. I left everything on the ground, the pillows where I had sobbed my eyes out. I left everything on the ground for the next three or four days, and I would just walk around that holy place because he gave me a vision of the end of time. He showed me that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people would come from the nations. More people will go to Israel than ever have gone before in time. And there will be so many young people going to Israel. They're going to go there and they're going to receive a new clarity of vision about the Great Commission. And they're going to go home to lives of greater influence. And he said, I want you to start this work called Philip's House where people will grow in greater influence. And it's going to influence churches in the Northwest and around the nations. And they're going to meet in Israel. They're going to be awakened, and they're going to go home and set the world on fire. Uh, the Lord then led me to a Messianic congregation, and word for word, the preacher that day preached everything God had said to me, including the five Bible passages he gave me. He read them out word for, I mean, word for word. I'm like, is there an echo in this room? And uh, I just called my wife in tears, and I said, something so profound has happened. And then when the war came, this is the message I've given to the people in Israel when I've spoken to many, many people there, is have hope, continue to persevere, because God gave me a clear vision that there is something beyond this war. You and I are going to see a day where the nations are going to come to Israel like never before. Why do I say this? Read Isaiah chapter 2. It says at the end of time, the nations will stream to Jerusalem, and you and I are living in those prophetic days. God is about ready to visit the nations, and he's going to use this church on the edge of this continent to reach so far, far away. You know, Seattle's in trouble. Did you read the Seattle Times this week? Some of you saw it. Uh, Seattle is now number one. It's something. Not good. We're the most unchurched city in America, most unreligious city in America. Uh, we're also the most depressed city, too. Of course, they took that survey in February. But why can't they take that survey in August? I think things get a little better. And when I look at that, I think, what's, what's going to change our city? How, how are we going to see people come to Christ? Many of you have loved ones you're praying for. How's God going to, God going to reach more people? We've got to get in line with God's plan. And today, it's my prayer that you get a vision from the book of Romans of what God's big plan is, and then how we play our small part within his big plan. The key to it is mystery, and what unlocks the mystery is wonder, and that's why this word wonder is so powerful this year, 
God has secrets, and he won't tell those secrets to any of us in this room until we slow down, put our phone away, spend less time on social media, and tune into heaven and hear what God is up to. God is planning things. Uh, stop watching so much news. Can I tell you something? I made a promise. I'm not watching any political news at all in 2024. You're saying, how can you pray? It's easy. I've got a Bible. I can pray plenty. I can pray for kings and for all those in authority. I, I, don't worry. There's plenty in here I can pray about. I don't need to know everything. And to be filled with all of that anxiety and talks. By the way, he may not have called you to that, but he called me to that. He wants my undivided attention so he can unlock his mysteries. So what is the mystery? I think that the book of Romans is the mystery novel of the New Testament. Now, mystery novels are usually written with houses. By the way, if you ever get invited by an English wealthy family like a lord or noble and they invite you to their summer house for a weekend event with a bunch of friends, don't go, okay? Because <laughs> you could end up dead. Or maybe solving a murder because that's how they all begin. And then they all end up in the living room afterwards because there's that showdown moment where all the, data, the information is shared and we know who, who done it. That's the world's mystery novel. But God's mystery novels are not about people who die, but about life. How is God going to reach more people on the planet? The book of Romans is written around a profound mystery. One of the last verses in this book, it says that all the Gentiles who are meant to be saved will be saved. It says also in this book that all the Jews, all Israel will be saved. It's just staggering. This is the mystery. And you and I are to press into the Father and to ask him to show us him what this mystery is about. Now, here are two key verses that will help you unlock the whole of Romans. Understand these two verses, and you're well on your way to understanding the book. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is true, true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind to be, uh, uh, sorry, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, when you read the word therefore in the Bible, always ask, what is it there for? Uh, therefore is a statement of logic. It says that everything from this point depends on everything that was said before. So Romans chapter 12 requires you to understand Romans chapters 1 through 11. So when I was in seminary, I studied under one of the most brilliant New Testament scholars in the world. And when we did the book of Romans, I still remember, he said, we're going to cover Romans chapters 1 through 8 because the rest is too complicated. He left out the most important part because Romans chapter 1 through 8 will explain how you and I can be saved. Jesus lived, Jesus died, he rose from the dead, that those who have sinned because we've all sinned, repent of our sin, we put faith in Jesus, and through our baptism we are raised to new life and we're filled with the Spirit to overcome the old person to live the whole new life. This is the book of Romans up to chapter 8. But there's a lot more because chapters 9, 10, and 11 explain how he's going to change the whole world. And the message is this, for 2,000 years, the Jews have been walking toward the Gentiles as the light of the nations. And at the end of time, he will use the Gentiles to walk toward the Jews to bring the Jews to a place of hope and faith. You and I live in the midst of that prophetic time. Um, Paul says that you and I are to give our bodies as living sacrifices. Some of you are moms and dads. We dedicated some babies. Dads and moms, you lose sleep, don't you? Why do you lose sleep? Because you love your child. Some of you are starting businesses, leading companies. You worry about debt load. You worry about employees and all the delivery schedules and all this kind of stuff. Why do you do that? Because you love your business. Why do we offer our bodies as living sacrifices? Because we're doing something important and we don't care about the burden it puts upon our body. So what should you and I give our bodies for? Paul goes on. He says, you and I should be transformed in the renewing of our mind. Most of us in this room live in a world 
where our friends on social media post incredibly important personal questions because they want to know what the crowd thinks they should do. This book encourages us to think independently, to be only concerned about an audience of one. What does God think? And when you get really comfortable thinking like God, then you can handle not thinking like the world. Now, this is hard, particularly right now, where the world is agreeing with the enemy. The devil hates the people of God. He hates the Jewish people, and he hates every follower of Jesus, too. And so we have to be renewed in our thinking to think like God. So what are we supposed to be giving our bodies for? How are we supposed to be renewing our mind? Well, the answer is in the other important verse of Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Most of us stop reading right there. But it goes on and it says, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Now, what would give Paul shame for the gospel? He's saying, I'm not ashamed. What would give him shame? First of all, he's communicating to a largely Greek and Roman world, and he's telling them that a Jew was convicted by a Roman law court, and this Jew was executed as, uh, you know, with capital punishment, death on the cross, and this is the man who formed our religion. This isn't something that you would brag about going through the Roman Empire, that somebody from death row is your spiritual leader, but this is the message of the gospel. So that would definitely give Paul some degree of shame, but there's more. The other is first the Jew and then the Gentile. He's speaking to Italians. They don't want to hear that God wants to reach Jews first and them second. They want to think Italians first, and I don't know about Jews at all. There is a power in the gospel, and it's the power of humility. It's a power of submitting ourselves to God's way of doing things, not our way of doing things. God has chosen to save us through the death, the shameful death of his son, the Messiah given to the world. And God has chosen to save us through the Jews who bring the light to the world, and we in turn bring the light back to them. That's the power of the gospel. And that's hard. Uh, right now, <laughs> I recognize that the world we live in is already preconceived. Uh, without even visiting, I talk to people all the time. I'll mention I've been to Israel or have experiences there. And people will tell me what they think the situation is. And I'll ask them, have you ever been there? Oh, no, they haven't been there. How do you know if you haven't gone somewhere? It would be like somebody judging your politics and your world without traveling to your situation. Travel is such a powerful, powerful thing. You and I need to have the courage to walk toward what's uncomfortable with the Word of God and to see things clearly. So here's what the book says. God has chosen the Jewish people not because they're better than anyone else, but rather that he has chosen them through whom he will bring his light. As he looked at the nations of the earth, over 7,000 different languages spoken on our planet, over 195 different nations. He chose one, Israel, to whom he would give the Bible, the Word of God that we would receive. Do you realize what's given to us in that? How many of you appreciate uh, having a flush toilet in your, in your home? Did you realize that that's a result of the Bible that didn't exist in human history? That is the result of God's rules about hygiene because all civic planning in our world comes out of the Bible. How many of you enjoy human rights, the Bill of Rights? Where do those come from? They come from the Bible. They're given to us by the Jewish people. How, do you love, how many of you love um, equality between human beings, the, the value of men, the value of women, the value of different races? Where does that come from? It comes from the Bible. It comes from the Jewish people. All the good things we have in our world come through... How many of you enjoy having a, a cell phone, a mobile phone that comes to you through juice? Uh, how many enjoy cherry tomatoes on your salads that come by through juice? There are so many blessings that God has brought into the world through the Jewish people, not because they are better, but because he's chosen to use them to bring light. He's made them first, 
not to make them greater than someone else, but rather this is a starting place. And in fact, if we make them first, then it's actually easy to ask what's second. One of the things that I love seeing in my trips to Israel is so many wonderful outbreaks of love between Jews and Arabs. You say, oh, Pastor Phil, that isn't so. I've watched the news. It's just terrible. They're just, you know, you need to travel. Uh, I have friends in Israel that are part of networks of pastors. And once a year, for the last 25 years, all the Jewish Messianic pastors and all the Arab Israeli pastors meet together at a secret location, and their families have camp together, so their children grow up knowing and loving each other, and they pray for each other and encourage one another. They support each other financially. That stuff doesn't make the news, does it? But beautiful things are happening in the body of Christ. You see, when you and I begin to travel, begin to walk and experience and ask questions, there's a much bigger world, much bigger things that God is working and things that he's up to. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because when we embrace this, the power of God is released. So you're going to say, Pastor Phil, what about Bothell? This is everything about Bothell. To build a bridge, you have to have two strong foundations. That's to be one end and another end. Here in Bothell, God is going to build a strong, prevailing church, regional influence for generations. And one of my commitments in my leadership portfolio is making sure that all the resources are put together so that God can build a strong and prevailing church here. So one of the cool things that's happening right now, we've had our third conversation with our friends at Krista Ministries, you know, Spirit 105 Radio, King Schools, the Senior Living. Uh, we're in communication with them about the potential of our new development that the school will become a King's School campus here at Evergreen Church. That's something that's unfolding, I think in part because we're working with God's plan and God's purpose. And part of that is loving his people and praying for the peace of Jerusalem. What we do there affects what we do here. On the other hand, a bridge has a foundation on the other side. On the other end of this bridge, God is opening up doors of relationship. I told you about our friends at Bet Hillel. There's this other choice place in Israel. It's called Virginia House. It is a five, six acre property overlooking the Sea of Galilee, right up from Mary Magdalene's house. It has a beautiful 180 degree panoramic view of the Sea of Galilee, and it's totally devoted to prayer and intercession. There are is accommodation for 44 guests to stay there at any time, and it is an incredible spiritual retreat. In a sense, it's like the church campus for all the churches of all the nations. On my last trip to Israel, Leslie and I were there for two weeks. I leaned across the table to the lady who oversees uh, Virginia House. Her name is Bina. I said, Bina, there's only one thing I want to know. Does do, do we as a church, Evergreen Church, Philip's house, the people that I bring, do we have a home in Israel? Do we have a place where we can stay? Is this, this can be like, I can call it my home. And she said, yes, this is your home. It belongs to all the church, of all the nations. So we got a bridge with two strong foundations. And trip by trip, we begin to build webs of relationship. And now this is where the mystery comes in. What I'm discovering is that Israel was chosen by God to be the center of the world because the whole world connects in Israel. Literally, the three roads that connect Africa, Asia, and Europe all go through Israel. But here's the other key. The leaders of the churches, both Messianic and the Arab-Israeli congregations, they are the best connected pastors in the world. They know all the pastors of all the churches of all the nations because they all visit there. Not only the, import, the, like the well-known nations of Europe and the Americas and South America, but some obscure nations, people that you've never seen or ever met before because every nation on the earth visits Israel. I cannot think of any other place in the world that's more connected than that. And that means if we build the bridge there, we're going to get to know people everywhere. Evergreen Church, you and I are on the verge of the greatest explosion of influence of the kingdom that we could possibly do, because this is God's strategy and God's plan. And as a result, we can love everyone well, because we follow God's pathway. I, I somehow I feel like that 
requires at least an amen. Amen. (sighs) I'm hearing Brock. Brock sent me a video last night. He has a vision for the Awakening Music Festival. And he's booked out the Seattle Center, Space Needle. When he went there to make the booking, they said, Christian event, are you going to like have a bullhorn and yell at people and tell them that they're going to go to hell? (laughs) Our world is so lost, it doesn't even know that Christians can have a good time together in the public space and worship God. People, our city is so lost and so dark. That's why I'm building this bridge. We've got to build a strong foundation here. We've got to build a strong foundation there. And we've got to change the nations of the earth and follow God's pathway. All right, so what are we going to do? First, the bridge of wonder is for you to be blessed by God's people. God wants to bless you through the Jewish people. You realize that everything that you receive has come to you through the Jewish people. Um, I had had a, a gal say to me, I can't go to Israel because that would be choosing sides. She actually had been to Israel before. And I thought, that isn't logical. It isn't logical at all. First of all, you're a follower of Jesus. Therefore, you call upon the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is revealed to you by Jews. You read the Bible that was written by Moses and totally by Jewish authors. You read the the promises of God, like from Isaiah. You put them on your walls of your home, and they all come from the Hebrew scriptures applied first and foremost to the Jewish people. You sing the Psalms that were written by David. In fact, every time you sing, you sing in Hebrew because you use hallelujah. Every time you pray, you pray in Hebrew because you finish your prayers with amen. That's where these words come from. And then you call upon the name of a Jewish Messiah who is given to you, and as a result, you become a child of Abraham, and then you are grafted into Israel. I think a side was chosen for you the moment you put faith in Jesus. You and I have to choose what we're going to do with the side that we're on and love from there, not against there. So what do we do with this? There's this uh, notion, you may have heard this, is that Jesus came into the world to start the Christian religion called Christianity. And once the temple was destroyed and the Jews went into exile, the, the church replaced the Jews. Can I tell you that is not only not in the Bible, but it is a lie from hell. God had a plan for the Jews. God still has a plan for the Jews. And there's a plan in the future yet for Israel. And you and I as the church are a part of it. Uh, On my trips to Israel, one of the things that I see regularly is the utter astonishment from Jewish people that their best friends in the world are evangelical Christians. Recently, you may not have seen it in the news, but the, the, the president of Brazil said some really hostile things against Jews in the public sphere. The evangelical believers in Brazil went to the streets in matching T-shirts. Over a million people in matching T-shirts marched in support of the Jewish people in the nations. And Jews around the world are reposting that video because they see that believers love them and believe in them. This is how significant it is. Now, Paul uses the, no, the picture of an olive tree. He says there's this beautiful, healthy olive tree. It's producing lots and lots of olives. This is Israel. And over there, around the fields, are lots of gnarly, sort of barren, wild olive trees. And the gardener prunes branches off from the healthy olive tree. They fall to the ground and die. And then he goes off into the wild olive trees and he cuts off branches. He takes his knife and he whittles and makes a little notch and he grafts them into this healthy tree. And as a result, they begin bearing fruit. You say, what's that picture about? It's you. The tree is Israel. And when the branches were cut, that created space for you to believe. If you believe in Jesus and you have faith in him and you have a hope of living forever in heaven, thank a Jew for the space that you have because you were included into Israel. Paul says this, if some of the branches have been broken off 
And you, though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others and now share the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do consider this, you don't support the root, but the root supports you. How long can a flower or fruit last without the root that supplies its nourishment? You and I can't survive without the Jewish people because that is the source of our whole faith. And you and I should have a deep sense of humility and respect. And when that begins, it then flows to every nation of the earth. I was speaking once to an Orthodox lady, beautiful head covering. No man has ever seen her hair except her husband. Uh, she wouldn't shake my hand, of course, because she's never touched another man except her husband. But she couldn't have been a warmer hostess. I was the only visitor at this tourist site. Uh, it's one of the most profound biblical sites. It's the site where the tabernacle was set when Joshua entered the land. It's where Samuel heard the voice in the middle of the night. It's where David got the sword of Goliath. You can actually see in the ground the post holes. you got to go and see this. You can see the post holes where the tabernacle stood. You can stand in the very place where the Holy of Holies was. Her family were the ones who purchased that land legally from the Arab owners, and they did the excavations. And her family were the first to plant vineyards in Samaria according to the word and the prophecy given to the book of, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31. And after this beautiful tour, incredible sight, I said to her, how does it make you feel that over two billion people around the world pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and read the he Hebrew Bible? She stopped and she took a breath and she began weeping. And she said, it's really overwhelming to think. And then she paused and she said, an Orthodox Jew, she said, what I love about you Christians is that you believe the Bible, especially about marriage and the family. What was I doing? I was a Gentile bringing light to the Jews. I've heard some people say, I want to go to Israel and preach to people. That's probably the most hurtful thing you could possibly do. But the best thing you can possibly do is to be Jesus to them. You see, they gave us Messiah, so at least we can be Jesus back to them, reflecting the light back to them that they have given to us. Paul says it this way. He says, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Every time somebody like you gets on a plane and goes to Israel, you raise questions, and they're asking, why are you interested in my God and my country and my land? This is our stuff. Why are you Christians interested? And you begin to dismantle so much prejudice. Leslie and I had an amazing coffee with a beautiful couple. He is the IDF commander. By the way, you probably never saw this in the media. The IDF paid for the hospitalization of all the refugees on the Syrian border next to Israel who did not have medical help from the Syrian government. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of people. He built the hospital on the border. He made sure that all these people received medical treatment. He speaks fluent Arabic. He said, in, before 2016, I'd never met an evangelical Christian. And then I started meeting you people, and you're amazing. He said, you just love people for the sake of love, and you have no, no ulterior motive at all. He said, more Jews need to meet you. We had coffee together. We showed them pictures of Evergreen Church, you. They were shocked. He said, don't you wear a robe or a collar or something like that? I said, no, we're just normal people. They're coming to Seattle. And I said, I'd love you to come and see our church. They wouldn't stop asking questions. You see, when you and I show interest, we pay attention, we create what the Bible calls envy, a hunger. Remember, they gave us Messiah. We reflect Messiah back to them. Here's the other part. A bridge of wonder is for God's people to be blessed by you. We have been blessed by the Jewish people, and now it's our turn to bless them back in return. So Paul goes back to the olive tree. He says, all around this olive tree are dead branches, and Jesus is going to reach down and take the dead branches and graft them back into the tree, and they're going to come back to life again and bear fruit. And all of you who are gardeners are saying, that's nonsense. When branches are dead, they're dead. 
but we're dealing with Jesus who rose from the dead. As Paul said, what is the salvation of the Jews but the resurrection of the dead? And the trees will live again. The branches will live again. Paul says they're going to be grafted in again. He says if they don't persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Uh, some of you th might think reaching people in our city, Seattle, is really hard. I can tell you reaching Jews for Jesus is a whole lot harder. Um, and the reason, uh, first of all, they've never, most likely, most Israelis have never met an evangelical Christian. I know this is crazy. Millions of Christians have gone there. But we're always in the buses and we don't talk to the people. So one of the things I'm doing in my tours is making sure that people on the buses meet the people in the land. Uh, most Jews have never read a New Testament. And those, in fact, if you ask the average Jew what the New Testament says, they will tell you that it's a book that teaches Christians how to persecute, harm, and kill Jews. Why would they say that? Because that's been their experience. Paul says Israel has experienced a hardening in part. What, what's this hardening about? So you know about the Holocaust. Six million Jews were killed with in industrial uh, precision uh, by just a horrendous demonic Nazi regime. And we can think that is Jewish persecution. But that's only one small part. You say, small part? I googled on Wikipedia to ask the question, what's the timeline of anti-Semitism like of other Holocaust events? What I got was 130 pages, 1,200 entries that span 2,000 years since the birth of Jesus. And most of it was perpetrated by people who were calling upon the name of Jesus. And sadly, many of them, as they committed their atrocities, said that we're doing this because you Jews killed Christ. And that is the deepest Jewish wound. I was on a tour in Israel with a Jewish guide. We were in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed all night. It was a beautiful time. He had given us quality time for prayer and reflection. When we got done, I just called our group, 45 of us together, and I said, um, I want you all to understand something that our guide isn't going to tell you, but what he has grown up hearing is that Jews put Jesus to death, and therefore, in anti-Semitism, they are deserving the persecution that they've experienced. What did the first Christians say? They wrote this creed. It's called the Apostles' Creed. Some of you grew up in churches saying it. I believe in God the Father, maker in heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ. What, what does the Apostles' Creed say? He suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was not a Jew. He was a Roman. And then I watched our guide sort of brighten up. And then I said, who put Jesus on the cross? I did by my sin and my wrong, not the Jewish people. After that moment, his heart began to open and a friendship blossomed between us because I walked in kindness. There's the secret. Paul says, practice and continue in his kindness, Romans eleven twenty two. 22. Never have Jews been so open to people who will help in practical ways and care. Uh, I think the future of trips to Israel has got to include humanitarian aid. There has to be concern about displaced families, about soldiers, about people who have suffered harrowing loss, both Jews and Arabs, by showing compassion in the land. As St. Francis said, preach Jesus everywhere you go and use words if you must. I have a dear friend, you're going to meet him on April the 14th. His name is Salim Salash. He grew up in Nazareth, hating Jews, throwing rocks at them, thinking that the Old Testament was a rubbish book and it had nothing to do with him. And then he met Jesus and he found true faith in him. And then he was invited to a study group with Jewish believers in Jesus. And at first he was like, what are these rabbis going to tell me what? And then he discovered 
how Jews are a light to the nation. His whole heart and demeanor changed. He began a prayer group that grew into church, and today, Home of, Home of Jesus the King Church in Nazareth is devoted to serving Orthodox Jews in their community with such love and such compassion in their humanitarian aid that the mayor of the Orthodox community in the middle of the war came to visit the church to figure out who are these Arab Christians who love Jews. That is the power of the gospel. So how can we enlarge our capacity to become a regional church for generations starting today? Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for the Israelites that they may be saved. Here are three things you could do. Number one, would you follow people who step up? I've been stepping up. Pastor Caleb's been stepping up. Evergreen Church, it's time for all of us to step up in a whole new way of passion for the gospel and begin with a simple, simple thing. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Just pray every day. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You could go into Amazon and order a little magnet for your fridge. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem because when you do, you're praying for Jews, Muslims, and Arabs. Number two, love the people who come to you over the bridge of wonder. In the next six weeks, you're going to meet an Arab Israeli pastor you're going to meet a Jewish Messianic pastor, and you're going to meet a beautiful Catholic nun who knows Jesus like nobody's business. And it's going to be an incredible six weeks that I didn't plan, that only God can plan, because God wants to open our hearts. And when you receive them, receive from the Lord. Here's the last one. Start saving for your next trip to Israel. In the Passover celebration, every Jew says, next year, Jerusalem. I think this year, it's this year, Jerusalem. I can't think of a better time to go to Israel than now. Uh, we're doing a church tour in October. Dina Marcy Valento are going to lead that one. We're going to be doing a father and son trip in April, small little trip, if you would be interested in that. We have a young adults trip happening in June, a, a time to learn and discover. And we, if you know Ilya, who came and spent some time with us, we're going to his wedding at the end of May. Uh, lots of opportunities. You can check it out. I've got a website. It's called Philip's House. Um, you can check that out. But at some point in your spiritual journey, you need to go to Israel. Because there, your Bible comes alive. Somebody called it the fifth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the land itself. But I want to do something right now. I want to invite you to stand. It's real simple. Perhaps you've never done this before, and today could be your first experience. I want us to do what the Scripture says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And in praying for the peace of Jerusalem, consider the Jews, consider the Muslims, and consider the believers, the Christians who live there. And then consider beyond that, the 16 million Jews around the world. I'm going to count to three, and the count of three, I invite you to begin praying out loud together as a church. So, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we pray that you would align us with your plan and purposes. I pray, Father, for perhaps some in this room that have never prayed a prayer like this before in their life. I pray as they pray that prayer that a faith would well up and a connection would happen by the Holy Spirit. I also pray, Father, that from this church you would build a strong bridge to the nations, to Israel and beyond. And I pray that you'd use our prayers here on earth to change things in heaven. So here we go. On the count of three, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. One, two, three. Father, the faces of so many people go through my mind. Muslims, of Jews, of believers in Jesus, the secular people who don't even care. God, we pray that you would visit Israel, visit with peace, and may many of us experience the opportunity not only to be there, but to make a difference, to be messengers of peace. And I pray that you build that bridge, build that strong foundation here, bring, build that strong foundation in Israel transform, we pray, the nations, transform our city, 
use Evergreen Church, expand our influence beyond what we could imagine in the power of the name of Jesus. And can we seal it right now with thanks in the name of Jesus? Amen. We believe you. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. We're going to sow our tithes and offerings into the Lord's house right now. There's a QR code that's on the screen you can use to help in your giving. There are little giving boxes at the door. But our hosts are going to come up with the white buckets. And I pray, Father, as we sow our tithes and sow our offerings, that you would grow them and they would grow up to bless us, to nourish us, to strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a baptism. Pastor Caleb is getting in along with Marcy and Whitney. Perhaps so that you can all see. Why don't you please have a seat? Strengthen her for the days ahead, and I pray that you would use her powerfully with her family, with her. 